All right, everyone. Uh, let's uh, just get started really quickly here. Oh, is, wait, where's? Uh, can you hear me, everyone? All right. There we go. So hello everyone, uh, I am James Gao. I am a uh, fifth year graduate student in, vision, in the vision science program here. And uh, I am working mostly on visual neuroscience. So since uh, you guys have already seen quite a lot of uh, scientific computing in Python already, I figured I'd give you kind of an end-to-end -end, uh, overview of one of uh, a common <clears throat> processing pipeline in neuroscience. So to start that off, I'm going to give you kind of a little of an overview of uh, what the data set I provided to you guys is and uh, how we operate on it. And then we'll go ahead and go straight into the iPython notebook and just run the whole data processing stream on it all at once. So just to kind of demonstrate to you all the visualization uh, and uh, visualization possibilities in Python. And also introduce you guys to at least the names of some of these packages that are uh, kind of new and upcoming and also very important in Python now. So just to start things off, um, in uh, neuroscience, uh, a, uh, an experiment can actually be extremely simple. We can show this brain right here, a uh, picture of a tin of spam, and we can record some kind of brain activity coming out of that brain in some methodology, which one of which I'll t describe to you later. And uh, the ultimate question in neuroscience, the question that we really want to answer here is basically what did that brain do, right? Uh, if we knew what the brain did, then we can feed it arbitrary pictures, pictures of cats, pictures of people, and it'll do the same thing as a brain, and now we can declare victory. We can say that this, if we can make this thing, it'll be, in effect, the same as a brain. So how do we do something like that? Well, we can take a cue from uh, the control process people and try to do something called system identification. So in this case, we're basically treating the brain as a big black box. And if we can somehow make the black box take the same picture of the tin of spam and give the exact same signal out of it, if we can maximize this correlation, then we can declare victory. Our black box is now a black box brain that is basically doing what a human brain is actually doing. Now one of the ways that we can do that is through just linearized regression. So uh, a lot of the, I, know, I realize that most of you probably aren't neuroscientists here, but a lot of the uh, techniques I'm gonna use here are actually common in a lot of different fields, and uh, my roommates are astronomers, and we are able to discuss more about the techniques than uh, other people in the vision science program when I'm talking, so <laughs> trying to kind of gives you an idea of how pervasive this kind of math is now. So uh, the method of the uh, type of data that I have provided you in the neuron.hf5 file is called electrophysiology data. That data set is actually simulated, and electrophysiology data is basically collected by sticking a small metal probe into some brain tissue and then looking at the electrical signals coming out of the brain. So uh, based on previous uh, publications, we know that basically one of the, you can regard a single cell of the brain, the neuron here, as operating as kind of a linear filter uh, on the stimulus. So if you show this neuron, if you input some sort of a, like a white noise pattern, for example, uh, and uh, it matches this filter that it sees. It'll basically fire off a spike, an electrical spike, uh, basically a large change in electrical potential. So this is kind of uh, an idealized uh, version of a neuron. Uh, real neurons don't really look like that. Uh, what I provided you guys in the raw signal looks more like this, whoops, this blue trace right here. So whoops. you can see that the blue trace here, you know, you get lots of nice noisy uh, electrical noise. You also get this kind of uh, weird oscillatory component, and you also get these nice clean spikes here. And uh, it basically becomes a problem here now. You have this uh, modeling problem that you want to address. You want to figure out what is the linear filter, but you have this data. What do you need to do with it? So obviously we need to pre-process the data, uh, this kind of pre-processing is uh, very common through many different fields. In this case, uh, we actually need to run uh, two different uh, frequency filters. Uh, a low frequency filter, in this case, gives us a kind of signal uh, known as LFP, 
which is just low frequency oscillatory components in the brain. And if we're concerned about the spikes, these things that uh, the neuron fires for, that when it sees a filter that it likes, and if we're concerned about those spikes, then the LFP is basically noise. We need to get rid of it. So once we have, uh, once we get rid of this LFP, we're left with these nice clean spikes. And the thing is, since you just stuck an electrode into the brain, we don't really know where, uh, which cell is actually hearing stuff from. So in this one channel, you're actually going to get a linear combination of many different cells. So we're also going to have to run a classification in effect to figure out where, uh, which cell fired which spike. So once we have this pre-processing uh, step done, we basically get a raster plot of the times at which each cell fired. And after we get that raster plot, we can basically just do our straight up linear regression now and uh, take our stimulus and uh, run linear regression on the raster plot and basically get our filter back that uh, we, we expect the neuron to be actually responsive for. So uh, let's just uh, switch straight over to the IPython notebook. Uh, we have the uh, SciComp2 file, IPython notebook that I uh, sent out. So let's go ahead and just open it. I'll kind of describe this to you guys uh, line by line even though it's already typed in. So last year it was kind of a fiasco when I had to type everything in and <laughs> follow along. So uh, the first line is just a whole bunch of imports. Uh, I'm sure you guys have already seen the NumPy import already. And the second line is a PyTables import. Uh, I think you guys touched up on it briefly in the scientific computing uh, first session. And this uh, tables is a kind of a data format that is supported in uh, both uh, MATLAB and uh, Python and a whole bunch of other uh, software packages. It's kind of a it's one of the better ways of saving large matrix form data sets. And uh, it, lets actually, it actually lets you slice into it uh, arbitrarily, uh, kind of like a memory mapped array. So it's efficient for very large data sets. We have scipy.signal, which uh, gives us access to a lot of the signal processing routines. So doing the filtering in effect. We have this new package called scikit-learn, sklearn. That's actually a very good package. I suggest you guys go on their website. If you just search scikit-learn on Google, you'll get their website. Uh, it's a very comprehensive uh, machine learning package in Python. And people are actively developing for it and introducing a lot of cool new uh, machine learning uh, algorithms. So in here, I'm actually just going to uh, import the submodules, the decomposition modules, which actually give you uh, various matrix factorizations like uh, principal components analysis, PCA, or independence components analysis, ICA, fast ICA. I'm also importing the mixture uh, submodule, which is basically the Gaussian mixture model. Uh, various type, kinds of Gaussian mixture models. Uh, uh, Scikit-learn actually gives you everything from just uh, plain Gaussian mixture models, which are basically probabilistic k-means all the way up to Dirichlet process uh, Gaussian mixture models, which actually try to do uh, model selection for you on the fly using a, Dir a Dirichlet process. And finally, I'm also importing the linear model, which actually gives you many different varieties of uh, regularized linear regression if you want to do the final modeling step in this case. And this last package I'm importing is a really cool package called MyAvi, and that's for doing 3D vis data visualization. And this is uh, much faster than MATLAB's implementation, which is you know, mostly just 2D plotting. MyAvi actually gives you access to the full capabilities of your graphics card. And I've actually personally pro programmed some very advanced uh, brain visualization uh, toolkits uh, using MyAvi. And uh, I'll demonstrate how to use this uh, later on. So let's go ahead and just uh, shift enter this and import everything. OK, so it's imported. So first things first, let's open up our neurons file. So if you guys haven't uh, gotten this uh, file already, I just suggest you go ahead and go back to the uh, Python Bootcamp uh, info website and download this file and just kind of play along here. Let's open this file and then just print it out. And we can directly plot the, one, of the, one of these raw data traces. So let's shift enter here. You can see that this file right here uh, actually contains, kind of gives you a little bit of metadata. And the metadata tells you that it was modified some date, and it also tells you that, that uh, there was actually two different data sets in this file. So it, the HDF5 file format is a hierarchical data file, hence the name. 
So the HDF5 file actually lets you store multiple data sets in a uh, nested group, uh, in any nested format that you'd like. So it's a very flexible format. And, and again, it lets you do kind of arbitrary slicing into it so you don't destroy your RAM if you have a very, very large data set or something. So I'm actually providing you both the raw data as well as the stimulus data that I use that uh, basically create this raw data. And if we look at the plot, we can see that this kind of this plot looks kind of like uh, that uh, trace that I showed you earlier. You get this uh, this high frequency spiking uh, activity, and you also get this low frequency oscillatory component, as well as the electrical noise that you expect to find when you just stick an electrode somewhere. So we have this raw signal. What do we need to do with it? So, like I mentioned before, the first thing we need to do is basically filter it. So this part is uh, very similar to MATLAB. Uh, the first line here uh, just creates a, a third order Butterworth filter that cuts off at 0.1 times Nyquist. And that gives you the filter coefficient. So this is basically just doing filter design. And I'm just going to use a, a standard forward backward filter that uh, doesn't introduce uh, phase shifts on this raw data. And I'm using this colon here to basically select all of the data because I want to pull all the data off the disk and filter it and store it into this LFP. And here I'm just plotting the first 1,000 time points. If we plot it and we can see that this, these two uh, plots are actually uh, time, time locked and you can see that it actually it looks like a low frequency uh, response of this uh, upper plot. <laughs> So we know that uh, now in this variable LFP, we have this low frequency signal. Uh, if we want just a high pass version of that signal, we can just take the, raw, the original raw signal and subtract off the low frequency component. And if we plot the first 1,000 data points, we see we have this nice uh, high frequency, uh, high pass filtered version of the raw signal. And you can still see these nice sharp uh, spikes in here. So once we have these spikes, remember, we now have to figure out uh, which cell created those spikes. So now we're switching over to our classification problem. And the typical way that we do this uh, is basically through a process called cell sorting, where you look at the waveform, uh, how each little subset uh, section of this data look, and compare it to different ones and try to create classes to figure out uh, what each cell looks like in effect. Uh, well, actually, the first step we need to do is basically figure out when these spikes occur. So what I'm doing here is basically just thresholding the data. So every time it exceeds 5 here, so if we look at 5 right here, it looks like every time it exceeds 5, it looks like a spike. So let's just go ahead and filter the, uh, show the binary form of that signal, and you get these nice spikes. And now we have to slice out the chunks of data where those occur. So first things first, we can just basically figure out when those spikes occur by using this differential to make sure we don't get the start and the stop. And that gives us the times, the times at which these spikes occur. We have at uh, time point 13, we have a spike, which is up here. At time point 43, we have another spike. At time point 103, we have another spike right there. So this is kind of what you'd expect from uh, the binary, basically just finding the times at which the binary kind of blips up. And now we're doing a little clever lips, uh, list comprehension here, which basically takes every single one of these times that we selected earlier and slices out a 30 sample chunk of the signal from that. So if we go ahead and just run this line here, what we've done now is uh, the spikes.shape shows you what kind of like the shape of the data. What we have is basically uh, 11 100 different spikes and 30 samples for each spike. And we plot the first 100 spikes, they look like this. And you can actually see already that there's basically um, kind of three different shapes for this, uh, these uh, cell spikes. So uh, we expect to find probably about three different neurons in this one raw signal. Is there any more data than what we saw? Uh, yes, this is only the first 1,000 time points. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I plotted them all, it would just be a dense mishmash of blue. You wouldn't see anything. So if you notice, I sliced just the first 1,000 right here. 
So uh, in this data set, this example data set, I provided about uh, 1,200 spikes uh, just to give you uh, enough data to do the system identification later on. So now we have this massive data set that has uh, you know, 1,100 uh, 1100 samples and 30 dimensions in effect. What can we do with it? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll probably have to do some sort of dimensionality reduction because if you want to do good, uh, <clears throat> if you want to do uh, good classification, you can't have too many dimensions; otherwise, it becomes a very hard problem. So let's just use uh, principal components analysis to reduce the dimensionality of the data. So this is again from Scikit Learn. You can use decomposition and then get the PCA object, and you're defining that you want only the first three dimensions from the PCA. And you can fit the data, and then transform it, and get the projections of that data. So, done. It's really, really fast to do that, because it's just an eigenvalue decomposition. It's really fast. But now, here's a little cool bit. We want to see all the projections in 3D. So, uh, since we uh, defined three dimensions, we can just look at it in my obby, and sorry for this little bug here. I set an option somewhere, and I don't remember where, but this makes it. You guys should already see this structure. And if you drag, you can see that it's actually nice and fast and smooth, and you can actually see that there are probably approximately three different clusters in here, right? We have a cluster that seems to be right here. Another cluster that's kind of elongated right there. We have a separate cluster that might be right over here. And this might be another neuron, but it's hard to tell. And Myabi actually has a lot of really cool features. I uh, suggest you try to explore it. Uh, points 3D is just the simplest, uh, let's plot the points out. But uh, I mean, the amount of features in here are immense. So here's kind of a stupid one. But if you have uh, red, blue, and a glyph glasses, you can turn that on and actually see it in 3D. <laughs> it's much more uh, impressive if you actually had more advanced data than just this cluster of points. So a lot of things are possible with Myabi. I uh, definitely recommend you give that uh, a try. Um, yeah. I should say that if you, if you install the 64-bit version for Mac of the, um, uh, from NSOC, Myabi won't work. Oh, really? So if you really need Myabi, go back to 32. Oh, that's annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Go figure. In any case, Myavi has a lot of cool toolkits because they, oh, yes? Uh, what's the difference between Myavi and Myavi 2 and VTK? So Myavi is basically just an advanced wrapper around the visualization toolkit VTK. And VTK is kind of this old uh, C++ based uh, toolkit for accessing a lot of scientific visualization uh, tools, but it's, you know, it's written in C, so it's kind of a pain in the ass to use. Uh, TVTK was basically NTHOT's attempt to wrap VTK using their library called Trace, which actually gives you a nice uh, GUI interface for changing all the, basically twiddling all the knobs all at once. And then uh, Myavi then took these TVTK objects and created an even simpler uh, wrapper around that to give you access to these very advanced uh, visualization functions using a very simple interface. So uh, the other cool thing about Myabi is you have this little pipeline window here. If you click on that, uh, it actually gives you a lot of things that you can do with it all of, like on the fly. So for example, you can change how, sorry, this computer is a little slow. You can change how all the glyphs look because you can. Uh, is it? Glyph source, there we go. Sphere source. So let's change them to axes if you want those instead. And see, it's all dynamic and it gives you a lot of uh, functionality all at once. So uh, if you need more information about that, I'd recommend checking out uh, Myavi 2. So Myavi was Myavi 1 was the original uh, version that uh, I don't think Enthal was the ones who made that. But Myavi 2 is the Enthal project that uh, is much more better developed. So give that a try. Any other question? So you, do you import Myabi 2 or Myabi? Just Myabi. Oh, okay. Yeah, from Myabi import and lab. Uh, that was the uh, command. So again, if you look at the uh, Myabi uh, website, they'll give you a whole list of uh, different uh, uh, plotting functions uh, that give you, you know, a lot of different things. So you can plot 40 charts if you wanted to. Take 3D slices, for example. 
there's a lot of uh, ways of accessing the Navi functions that are very, very powerful. Okay. So we see that there's approximately about three clusters that we want to pick out. So let's just run a very, very simple classification algorithm. Let's use Gasha mixture models. So Gasha mixture models is, in effect, a probabilistic k-means. So uh, if anyone's familiar with k-means, basically you have a, a cluster of points uh, and you randomly assign, randomly drop your cluster centroids uh, in your space, and then you basically assign the closest points to them and then shift the centroid. In uh, Gaussian mixture models, instead of assigning uh, points to a single cluster, uh, you basically assign a given a probability uh, using a Gaussian, uh, <coughs> Gaussian distribution around that cluster. And then you have a probability belonging to each uh, cluster, and you kind of shift the Gaussians around until they converge. So in this case, I'm creating the mixed, I'm from the mixture sub-module, I'm uh, getting the Gaussian mixture of a model object. I'm saying that I want three, three uh, mixtures in the end. I'm going to uh, fit that model to, to the projections. And that gives me this GMM uh, object right here. And then using this GMM, I can actually just directly predict the original data, and it'll give me basically the labels assigned to each spike. So if we print the first 10 labels, you can see that, look, it thinks that the first four spikes uh, belong to class zero, and the next spike belongs to class one. So this is just a really quick and simple way of doing uh, classification effect, and that allows us to basically create the raster plot, which is what the next step does. So in this, uh, in this uh, box here, I'm actually starting with uh, a zero, uh, basically a zero matrix, and uh, has the length of, uh, the, basically it's the time by the number of uh, unique labels. So basically that's saying how many cells I have. And then uh, for each one of these unique labels, I'm basically uh, selecting each time it is uh, found in the times and setting that, that uh, as, setting that as one uh, where they occur and zeros where they don't. So if we just plot that data set, we should get three different lines. And again, since I'm only plotting the first uh, 30 time points here, we can see that you know, we have a spike here, spike here, spike here, and this is a different cell, so it's a different color, so it's a different line. So now we have that uh, raster plot that we have that we needed to start our modeling procedure. So we can actually go on to the regression step and try to figure out our linear model, basically figure out what each cell cares about. So here I'm uh, in this next uh, box. Uh, the first line is, again, I'm just pulling down the stimulus, all the stimulus time points, uh, basically the stimulus that the neuron saw at each time. And then I'm creating this new ridge object, which is basically just doing taking off regularized uh, uh, linear regression. I'm giving a uh, regularization parameter of 10. Typically, you would uh, actually use uh, cross-validation to figure out the correct, uh, the best uh, ridge parameter here. But, uh, and uh, scikit-learn actually gives you many functions for doing you know, everything from uh, generalized cross-validation all the way through just plain old grid search. And they give you a lot of functions for doing this. And it's really powerful, so you can check it out. But let, let's just pick 10 for now, because it's a convenient number, and it's fast to run. So here we just fit this linear model to the stimulus and that uh, raster plot, and bam, it's done. We have our model already. We have the coefficients of the model get stored into this COEF model, so basically that's what your weight matrix is. And since we had three response channels in effect, we have three uh, uh, model weights, and we can just go ahead and look at them. If we just plot them, you can actually see that this cell cares about this kind of a biphasic spike. And this next cell cares about, this one's a little noisier, it's just a single spike in the middle. And this last cell is, again, a different, slightly noisier biphasic spike. So basically, this is just a very simple example. It's going through all the steps from, collect, from this raw data stream, uh, filtering it, pre-processing it, doing classification on it, and finally doing full-blown modeling on it, and notice how quickly it went by. So 
Again, the, pro uh, the, uh, <coughs> the packages that I used here are a lot, mostly um, scikit-learn. Uh, SciPy has a lot of the functions already, which is installed on most computers. And Myavi also gives you all the 3D uh, visualization toolkits. So if there's any questions, um, that's all I have. Yeah? Uh, I, I'm a little slower if you see this guy. So just curious, what kind of information can you, can you like, sure. get from this? So basically, this, is, this uh, trace here is basically if you had, uh, if the neuron had a, a hundred inputs into it, and a hundred inputs looked like this, the neuron would spike. The neuron spikes whenever the inputs look like this, in effect. So if you imagine this to be an image, if you just raveled it, uh, unraveled it and put it all into a line, if the image looked like kind of like this little wavy shape, the neuron spikes whenever it sees a wavy spike that looks like this. That's just, uh, this is just a very short example data set, so I didn't really try to make it uh, too realistic. But if you actually try to do this kind of regression with actual neural data, you'll see, especially with uh, visual neurons, you'll see small little uh, kind of like uh, Gabor functions. Yeah? Chris, when you're actually doing analysis, what, what is your workflow sort of thing? Do you work in the notebook or do you work in the, in so, the this is a fairly uh, simple example uh, from my personal workflow. Um, so it, usually I'm actually developing algorithms, not just using the existing ones. So in that case, I actually do need to use the original, uh, the console version of IPython because uh, I need the debugging mode, which isn't supported yet. Yeah, but uh, if I needed to run uh, like a uh, an analysis that I had code for, like this one, for example, then yeah, by all means, I would probably do it in here because it's just so much easier to just plot it out. It's really, really fast to kind of interact with it and see what happens. So this is definitely the preferred way of doing things, if possible. Yeah? After you disambiguated the different neurons, when you go back to the random dot pattern, what kind of... Uh, receptive field structures do you find? Uh, in this case, I kind of uh, simulated a very simple, uh, the simple cell receptive field architecture. So uh, if you basically just took the, if you just weighted the firing rate of the neuron by the, oh, sorry, if you just weighted each one of the random dot patterns by the firing rate of the neuron at that time and just average those together, you'll actually see the neural receptive fields. And uh, most of the time in early visual cortex, you'll actually see small uh, Gabor functions, which are basically just uh, sine wave gratings with a small Gaussian window over it. And that's uh, a typical form for uh, early visual cortex. Uh, you'll also get cells that are phase invariant, so they don't care about uh, light or dark versus darker light. Uh, and uh, that's uh, basically, and also a lot of uh, movement sensitive cells. So if you actually average a small time course around the times at which those occur, you'll actually see kind of this little gradient shifting around in the receptive field. So depending on which cells you get, you actually get a pretty big variety. And that's uh, the early visual cortex cells we know the most about. Those work pretty well. And beyond that, we have really crappy models for. So <laughs> that's an area of active research. In fact, I happen to know that two of the stats people uh, from my lab uh, <laughs> are working on just that problem right now. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Thank you.